All right, so since I know what happens after this session involves free gear, I'm going to try and be relatively brief. So you'll get out a couple minutes early and get to the front of the line downstairs. That means you chose the right session. Good job. All right, so last session of the day. Hopefully you've seen some good technical content so far. Uh, just to give you a brief introduction if you haven't seen me yet today. My name is Matt Pollock. I'm a senior systems engineer in the Embedded Systems Group here in Austin. Uh, what that means is I help our largest customers come up with the designs for their most ridiculous systems. Uh, short answer is I get to play with the big toys. I love it. And as part of that, what I get to see is a lot of different applications. I get to see quite a bit of different challenges that our customers face, and we have to find some way to get them past it. So what we'll be talking about in this session is the output of some of that work that you might be able to take advantage of. So how many of you like doing everything from scratch? Yeah, I like it too. How many of your customers like paying you for doing everything from scratch? Zero. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. If so, I want to know who your customers are. <laughs> All right. So why do we have reuse libraries? Basically, learn from our fail. We've gone through the process of figuring out how to do this type of work. Uh, I typically work on the embedded system side of things, where it's the same repeated patterns every time. Customers need to solve the same kind of challenges, oftentimes inventing their own solutions, and everybody I talk to has invented their own version of something. I mean, one of the classic examples is so many customers and so many alliance partners uh, several years ago build their own test executives and test sequencers. Well, we make a product called Test Stand that takes care of most of that. Uh, these are not products. These are libraries that we make available to you that you can download, incorporate into your applications. Steal, please steal them. Take them, use them as much as you wish. The whole idea here is don't reinvent the same wheels. So I put this up at the beginning. I'll put it up at the end again. The code that we have is not a product. If you are interested in the license terms under which this is typically released, that's at ni.com slash sample code license. It's a whole bunch of legalese that basically says, don't sue us if it doesn't work. I'm not a lawyer, but that is my interpretation of it. We don't know that they're bad, but it's up to you as someone who incorporates these designs into your application, make sure they work for you. You still have to do due diligence and test your system to make sure that your systems work properly. This can help you do that, but it isn't a substitute for doing that yourself. So legal disclaimer out of the way. And I'm going to go in and talk about what we've actually got for you. If you remember nothing else, remember ni.com slash reference designs. This is where the system engineering group posts all of our material. You can go up there and browse through the catalog of stuff you can steal. Odds are pretty good there's something up there that you haven't seen before because we post things up there fairly regularly. And I don't cover every single thing that's posted up on that page in this presentation. Rather, I'm going to go through basically greatest hits of stuff that gets downloaded and used quite a bit, as well as new material that you may not have seen yet. Anybody been here before, downloaded or stuff? Some? What do you use now? AMC. Nobody else uses it. CBT. Lots of three-letter acronyms. We love our acronyms. Anything else? SDM. SDM. Another three-letter acronym. Anything else? So I'm going to talk about some of those as well as a couple others as we go through here. If those were foreign acronyms to you, you've never heard what those are, it may be worthwhile to jot those down when we get to them, because they can save you some pretty good chunks of time with questions. So the way that the presentation is structured, because I'm an embedded guy, I look at an embedded application, go through an embedded application and look at what code you can steal to help get that application done. And a lot of these pieces can be used for test applications, desktop applications, what have you. Um, this is just my area, so I structured it where it was. So it might look something like this. You got a host computer with the UI on it. 
You've got a compact Rio with an RT system and FPGA doing some stuff. And of course, all of your code has error handling and watchdogs and good stuff like that, right? Right? Oh yeah, always. I hope always. Please always. All right, so one of the ones I heard mentioned was the waveform API. If you need to pull in waveform data on a compact Rio, anybody ever done it? Few. Did you do it from scratch? No? Maybe the first time? How, how great was it the first time? Do half the stuff that you said you should do. <laughs> yeah, our, our compact gears are great for single point control. They weren't really designed for waveform acquisition, like say DECMX. So getting a compact gear to pull in waveforms, put a timestamp on them, do good error handling, put it down to disk. It's actually pretty complicated. Usually, when I see customers trying to do this themselves, it is a disaster. And they call up our support lines and ask, hey, how do we do this? It's hard. We say, yes, it is hard. We did it for you. And we point them to this. And this is that term that might be difficult to remember. If you search our site for this, Compact Rio Waveform Reference Library, this already implements the FPGA logic and provides an RT API for getting good, clean waveform data off of your Compact Rio system. I strongly recommend that you don't build this from scratch. If you think you need something other than single point data off a of compact Rio, if you have an accelerometer module, if you have a microphone module, you better be using this. Otherwise, you're going to be sad. We already did the work for you. Steal it, please. So it basically gives you a DACMX style API down here where you can create your channels, configure your timing, set some buffer sizes, and go. As opposed to the probably much nastier code that you might write yourself that doesn't have good error handling. This does it all for you. It also handles all of the FPGA logic to be the most efficient known implementation for this. Upshot is, before we had this API in place, the maximum acquisition rates we could get on Compact Rio were about half of what they were after this. It's very well optimized. It works great. Please steal it. Please. So both all the FPGA code that you really don't want to have to recompile 20 times, and the RT code that you're going to do. If you want more than just an API to pull a waveform off of a module, we also have a complete sample project. This is something relatively new you may not have seen. That's the after that you gave the presentation. There. It's called Embedded High Speed Data Logger. This manages data coming in at high speeds on Compact Rio, logging to disk, and getting it out over to a Windows PC for analysis, viewing, database management, what have you. If you're looking for a nice, clean, embedded data logging solution, which is something a lot of our alliance partners build for their customers, you might consider looking at this as a starting point. We publish it freely, steal it as much as you like. Add in whatever 10% of extra code you need for your project. Put your logo on it. Make some good money. Yeah. Uh, is it the same sample project that we have the compactory or addition to all of So there is a set of, great question. Is it the same as the compact Rio FPGA waveform acquisition and logging sample project that comes with LabVIEW? It is not the same. The sample projects that ship with LabVIEW are how to put this politely. They were designed by committee to be something a committee of people could agree on as a way to do something. The sample project that ships in LabVIEW was actually based on this and took what we thought was a good design, put it through committee, and that's what ended up in the product. I am very biased. I think our version is better. But feel free to look at both. Compare, take whatever you like from either, but they are different. And this one in particular is a very nice example because it also has documentation as to how to customize the FPGA and also all the host code needed to manage TDMS files, collections of waveforms, etc. It, it goes a lot further. I think it does a better job. Any of you ever have to build a data logger? Yeah. 
it's kind of like the stereotypical application that we have to put together. So rather than do it all from scratch, take a look at this. It might work for you, it might not. But if it doesn't work for you, you might at least steal some ideas. Uh, at the very least, I certainly recommend stealing the logic from this example that manages the available hard disk space on the compact review. It checks see how much available disk space you have, deletes old files in the data directory until you're back below a safe threshold. That's logic that should be in most systems that are touching the disk. Steal it. It's already written for you. Done. Other uh, questions, comments on these? I know I'm going kind of fast. My intention here is not to go into deep detail on each, but to just let you know what's available in case you weren't aware of them before. Cool. All right. So local state data. Let's say I want to make two different values available in two different loops of my system. Uh, please, please, please don't be using local variables for this purpose. It's not a good idea in general, and especially not an embedded system, to do your data transfer via a front panel that doesn't exist in a deployed RT environment. Please don't do that. Instead, I heard a couple people mention CDT. That's typically how we work with it in system engineering today. And I'll also be talking at the end about what we're building out to replace CDT. But right now, if you've ever built a functional global that has the data that you need in your system, uh, just show hands. Functional global, know what this is? Yeah. Anybody ever build a dysfunctional global? <laughs> yeah, a bunch of us. Yeah, I, I've seen it too many times to count. So current value table, also known as CDT. This is a very highly performant data lookup engine. It's based off of single point data, latest value only, totally non-buffered, tag-based communication between different loops of the system. The idea is you access it by name, and this does a lookup, finds that data value, gives you the latest version of that value, spits it out. Now, this is extremely well optimized in the sense that in the typical use case where you have a constant wired in here, we actually only do the lookup the first time. After that, we cache it and never have to do the lookup again. Because of that, this is actually faster than the variant lookup table trick, because that one has to do a search. It's a binary search. We're doing an array index. We're faster. You're not going to get faster than this unless you use a global without any protections or any other niceties around. Usually I use this in simple systems that need to get data from a config file, populate a global data table, and then only in the places where I'm actually using those config values, I access them via CDT. Otherwise, you get the mega cluster going all through your system. In the back. Yeah. Um, if you had the CDT in a for loop, they have a constant array going in, but it changes through the for loop, does it have to look it up each time, or does it do the same thing? So if you have, say, instead of a constant here, it goes through a set in a for loop, maybe building it up each time? Yeah, so yep. I have one call to the CDT with an array of constants, and I'm building up an array of values, right? Correct. So it's one call to the CDT. To the so path, there's a pair of APIs here. One is the usually used one, which gives you by name. You can also manually call the lookup name and get index function for it, and then access by index. So you have a for loop where the array is not a list of names, but an array of indices. That is just as fast. Good question. Keep me on my toes at the end of the day. So something that I'd like to point out here, if you're building your own global data table type of system, you're probably not going to make it as efficient as we did. I know this because we're on version 3 point something of the library that right now. This is execution time of version 2. This is version 3. And that little green pixel over there is how long it takes for this type of operation. Almost every customer I've seen, their performance looks more like this than like this if you build their own. Please don't reinvent this wheel. We already did it. We spent years making this thing as efficient as we can. 
Don't waste your time. There's lots more interesting problems to work. So how many of you use this, CBT? Any trouble? Do you like it? I like that it works streams also. I also like that it works streams. This is kind of a, maybe an advanced question on CBT. You know, a lot of the programmers I work with have, you know, enjoy the fact that they can dynamically create the names, right? You know, so they can, you know, I have channels 0 to 15, so I'll have channel and put it in 15 element 4, they've been great for the names. Sure. Them in there. But then later it's much harder to find like where a channel is written and things like that. You know, I can't search CBT the way I can a global or shared variable or something like that. Is there like a guideline or something in place that would help with that? that that's that's the main stumbling block I find in CBT. Or so there you find a rather fundamental trade-off. Either you have to explicitly drop the specific one you want each time and thus be able to search for it if you're looking through your code, or you use something that can get reused and build up the string, or use an array of indices, for example. I, there's not really a nice solution to that problem. Okay. Uh, usually what I would use in those cases is if you are familiar with the bookmark manager. So right. if you put a, I'm old, pound, hash, whatever. And uh, in your com you just drop a comment there with a bookmark on it, and then use the bookmark manager to find every place that you're doing that. It's a little bit more efficient than just doing a text search. Okay. Yeah. Are, are there any um, libraries for uh, code that takes uh, maybe an INI file or an XML or GXML and puts it in the CBT? Yes. What is it? So all the tools I'm showing currently are ones that have been around for a little while. Uh, closer to the end, I'll be talking about where we're putting our current investments. And it's to address a similar use case to that one. So if I'm able to table that until a little closer to the end, I can talk about it all at once. But yes, we're working on it. Four? Cool. All right. So biggest thing here, it's tag communication, latest value only. We don't give you any protections against writing to the same tag twice. So you can still get race conditions with CBT. You got to be careful. If I write to the same name tag for three different loops, it's a race condition. We don't stop. Watch out. And yeah, it does a little bit of memory access, but very, very little. We've optimized it as much as we possibly can with this architecture. Network comps. So I like network streams, as was mentioned before. Network streams are very handy if you're talking from LabVIEW to LabVIEW. I wish that was the case in every application I worked on. Unfortunately, the real world doesn't look like that. Not everybody in the world uses LabVIEW yet. I might have to interface with something else. Usually that means that I need to build my own custom TCP protocol. Because TCP is the least common denominator these days. Anybody ever write one of those? Did you remember error 56? Do you have a reconnection loop? Did you have it the first time? Probably not. Neither did we. Uh, one of the other three letter acronyms was STM. Uh, it was originally simple TCP messaging, but for reasons lost in the mists of time, it is now just simple messaging, and the T stands for nothing. Uh, don't get me started. Uh, but we already implemented a custom TCP protocol that's extremely lightweight and can also talk over to a C application as long as it follows the same interface. It's very simple, it's very straightforward. It's what 80% of the customers I've worked with needed to build in those circumstances. It just sends some metadata up front and then sends a message name with some message data. It's all associated with it. And then under the hood it takes care of the sending the four byte header that says how long the next transmission is going to be, sends the data packet, and the reading side reads the four byte header, and then does a TCP read of that line. If you've ever done the TCP protocols before, you've probably written this logic at some point. Skip some bugs, use ours if you can, might save you some time. Question? Yeah. That's like the way to say that not some newer I'd like to 
And that's part of the goal of the presentation. The ones I'm showing here are ones that are still the current use this. And I'll talk a little bit about ones that were deprecated. Because there's a lot of cruft out there. We've been doing this for a long time. Uh, the state of the art has changed over the years. And some of the libraries that we put out 10 years ago aren't all that useful right now. So I will talk about some that you don't have to worry about. Right now, this is still the best we've got for needing to write a custom TCP protocol to something other than LabVIEW. If you can go LabVIEW to LabVIEW, I use that change. Personally, I like it. So, comparison. Ah. LabVIEW to LabVIEW for network streams. It's one direction only. So if you need to do two direction communication, command response, you need two network streams. Not so with the TCP communication. A little bit more lightweight, but it doesn't give you automatic reconnection. Network streams do automatically reconnect. TCP does not. You get to write that logic and put in those code hooks yourself. We help a bit with SDM, but you still got to put it in. Trying to go quick because I know free beer happens in a couple of minutes. We'll get you out for it, I promise. All right, other things here. <coughs> Configuration data. So starting to address your question, Mark. How many of you have configuration of your system consisting of constants on your block diagram? Yep. How many of you started with that and did something better? Okay, good one. Honest people, excellent. What do you do? You know where to yeah, pull it out to the file. Yeah, usually I see people pulling it from constants to a front panel to a configurable file, usually just a text file. And then usually they go out to an XML or a JSON. And then from there you go out to something that's written from a configuration editor. Uh, not least because typos. Anybody ever type the wrong value into a config file and your system goes nuts? <laughs> I have done this. It was embarrassing. We have a few tools that might help you with this. Uh, one of the older ones that we've got uh, that I don't have in the presentation is GXML. And uh, since that was created, there's a couple of other XML toolkits out of the community that I think do a better job. Rewrite anything? Yes. Uh, that's actually one that I'm thinking of there. Um, just for those in the back that couldn't hear, rather than GXML, I'll usually use something like More Good Ideas is Rewrite Anything library. It, I think that's a little bit better job than we did. But we also have a configuration editor framework. If you've ever had to write a configuration editor in LabVIEW, you, how many of you have ever done this? Was it fun? No. Yeah, usually writing heavy UI code in LabVIEW tends to be quite tedious. Uh, not least because trying to get a usable tree control is rather challenging. Uh, we did quite a lot of work to get a framework around this with an ice tree control that you can just plug into and define different classes that can get brought into the system. Basically, this is just a sub-panel that loads in a UI specific to a particular class. You don't have to worry about the plumbing. We took care of that. You care about creating the specific configuration for that type of thing. This also lets you do validation. So you can have someone type in a value that makes absolutely no sense and have it auto coerce to the correct value, or the maximum value or pop up an error saying, hey, fool, you don't really want to do that. Probably a little bit more polite. It depends on your operators. If you remember somehow my next or better sense, what? If you remember somehow my next or better sense. That's similar design, yeah. Uh, Max and Veris stand follow the same type of paradigm. If you go to Tools, Options, and LabVIEW, it's exactly the same idea. A tree on the left with the sub-panel that gets loaded in, same idea. Rather than rewriting the same thing again, you might consider using this framework. We took care of most of it for you. Don't write one from scratch. It'll be hard. It'll hurt. Steal ours. You'll have a better time with it. I pick up the animation there. Right, other one. How many of you have heard this acronym today? Yay! All right, we're getting that. Together. What's that? All right. Well, that's because we changed. We figured out that name about two months ago. 
So distributed control and automation framework is where we're putting most of our investments right now in terms of new work for reuse libraries. It's a combination of a very clean configuration editor with plugin modules, each of their own configurations, to build up control and automation systems quickly. The idea is it combines CVT on a wire. So instead of a functional global, it's a big cluster that a user can't touch on a wire, fully namespaced, so that you can have three different sets of them with no conflicts. Plugin modules to let you provide functionality for input processing and output as well as a full mapping engine to connect the two, all those different pieces together. So in terms of the question mark of what we were doing to consume a configuration file and get a system running based on that, this is my best answer. And this is where we're going right now. And the idea here is if you've ever tried writing a piece of really good embedded software, there's a whole list of things you have to think about that most people don't bother. And it's the real world, you've got to ship something, your customer says now, now, now. You're going to lose money if you don't get it out there next week. And usually that's the point where compromises happen. You don't put in all the error handling you should have. It, maybe you didn't test for memory leaks as much as you could have. Maybe you didn't try to optimize performance. Where you did all the plumbing work in here, it's as good as we know how to make it. This is where we're going uh, from our perspective. So. If you use any of these other tools, so CVT, CCC, AFC, SDN, and whole litany of other ones, uh, that involve moving tag data around in a system, we're basically subsuming those with DCAP. If you're around last year or the year before, you may have seen the Tag Bus Data Framework, also known as TDDF. Uh, we called it that because we couldn't figure out a good name for the final name of this thing, that's TDD. Final name of this is Ecap. We like coffee. We're nerds. So the idea here is rather than build up a system from smaller components, we're giving you a full control framework to plug into. I strongly recommend giving it a look. It's something that's open source, not a product. We published this one actually under Apache 2 license, which means you can. Uh, I'll show you links to those. Uh, we recorded a set of training videos on those already. Uh, those are up on our page, and I'll show you the page again. It's not perfect, but every new application we work on, we make improvements and we post those improvements up. You're free to take a look at it, steal it, put your logo on it, sell it. The license terms permit this. We don't care. Because if you're using decaf, it is something that requires a live development environment and runs on PCs, compact trios, compact DAX, compact vision systems. You might notice a theme about NI hardware here. If you're using this, you're probably buying NI hardware. We don't need you to pay for this. We're trying to get you to build the systems you're already building anyway, but a lot more quickly and more efficiently. We really don't like answering the same support call from 100 different customers struggling with the same problem. And this is how we're trying to address that. And we've tried addressing it you know, over the years with some other tools. This is the best we've got right now. And we've got a number of plugins that are already out there. And previously, each of these plugins might be a separate reuse library system engineering we might provide. What we're doing now is providing every new thing that we make plugs into this framework. So every time that you work with your local sales rep and ask for help from an eye of how do I do something, Odds are pretty good the output of that is going to be us making a new one of these. And then we can publish it out for everybody else to get. So, where to go? If you're looking at where to browse the list of reuse libraries, ni.com slash reference designs is your primary source. This is where you can go to look at what we're working on and just look through and see if there's anything interesting. Uh, another one that we've got up there, for example, is a, uh, if you ever have to deal with resizing UIs for different customers, maybe your customer has a 12-inch screen and a 15-inch screen at some of their stations, we've got a front panel resizing tool that can help with that. It's a safe snapshots at certain sets. It can load and reload those from disk without having to deal with the auto-size plug. 
I won't call it a feature, it's a bug. That's yeah. a nice way to work around that one. And anything that you find on there, typically we publish it on Live Tools Network. And you can also download them from that package manager. And just to give an idea of what we're doing from the DCAP side of things, uh, too much. We have quite a few packages out on Tools Network today uh, that are the DCAP framework and the different modules you can download. That list is going to get a lot longer as we continue building these out. And just about everything else that we publish is going to be as a package on the Tools Network. Yeah. Are we looking to do anything for CAM? Uh, we do not have a CAN module right now, uh, but we do take submissions. Uh, we actually host everything for DCAF over on GitHub. So if you want to create your own, you can actually post it right up on our repository. Everything's open source. Pop up on there, submit it. If you find a bug with something in DCAF, you don't have to wait a year for the next library release, or longer. You can go on GitHub, pull a copy down, make the change, post it back up, and fix. Don't wait for us. Fix it yourself. Yeah. Where do we find descriptions for all of those modules? Because on the package manager, it's just a big list. It's yes, hard it to is. tell what's what. So that's what this page is for. So, so the different modules that you can download, not just decaf modules, but all the other pieces that we've got, Every one of those is going to have a page, another comp slash reference designs, with a description of what it is, and a basically a discussion for support, where you can talk with people that are actually developing it. So that's more of the, the guide to everything. The Tools Network Event Package Manager is the list of stuff to grab without a whole lot of detail. And in the case of DCAP in particular, we've got our own page, another slash DCAP, linked from here as well. But that's got the set of videos we recorded. Uh, it's got sets of hands-on material and examples, demos, a whole bunch of other stuff, as well as the list of what we have in work. GitHub is where we've got the actual repositories. You can see on there everything that we're working on. You can take a look at the current state of something. If you've got a bug, post it there. Report an issue directly to us right there. Or fix it yourself and post a fix. We'd love to not have to do this all ourselves. We'll take anything we can get. And something else uh, that came to my attention earlier, uh, Veristand add-ons are available as well. Our HIL team has been building out some, uh, some add-ons into the Veristand ecosystem as well. They have failed to put it on any.com slash reference design, so we'll get on them about that. You can find those here on GitHub. So I know we still have a little bit of time, and I promise I'll get you out of here early. But I want to take a second and just check in with you. Is there reuse code that you need that we're not giving you? Is there something that you're finding yourself developing project to project that you're wasting a lot of time building that you really wish there's got to be a better way to do something? What is something so that we know where we can help? Oh, the AQ character lineage. Ah, yes. So you can see the sort of problem space it's trying to solve. The configuration editor is doing the same thing, but if I add to it, the ability to add to load plugins, right? Right? The configuration file, things like that. And that's something that you know, even you, know, you talk about MGI and GXML, all of those all being wrapped up together so that you can handle your dynamic loading of uh, some sort of binary at project library or something. Mm -hmm as you're parsing those files. So for those of you in the back, the question basically relates to, if you've never heard of Aristos Q, uh, also known as Steven Mercer, also known as the guy in LabVIEW R&D who developed half of the stuff you use, errors, classes, and queues, just about everything that you use on a daily basis, he wrote. Uh, he also wrote a tool called the AQ Character Lineator which was basically just a Google bomb so that nobody else would have the search results. A way to take some data, send it over the network to something else and load it in. 
and uh, it's technically excellent, but I find it to be far too heavyweight. I personally follow the what we do with DCAP, which is to separate configuration from the classes. Configuration is just a JSON or XML file in most of my use cases. And then I have a scripted includes file that just gets generated based off of what classes my system uses. And then I just make sure I send the, the I over and the config over, and that's sufficient. Uh, proper discussion there is going to take a lot longer than I have here. But I'm willing to talk. Okay. Others? For the buffer, basically. Okay. We do have a design up there for circular buffer implementations. Uh, it does exist. I haven't touched that one in quite a while, so I can't quite comment on the current state, but that's good to know. Others? What do you wish we had? There's, first off, I'd be remiss not mentioning for XML serialization and deserialization. There is the flattened to XML and unflattened from XML lab. I have to mention it. <laughs> I know. Uh, which is all right for basic types. Uh, if you're dealing with things that are more complex, if you want to go the heavyweight route, you can use the AQ character lineator to push things down and uh, build your own custom formatting classes for XML. You could use GXML, which is something we haven't touched in some time, but is good for getting clusters now, not so much classes. And you might also consider uh, MGI's uh, rewrite anything with the eyes. And if you know of others, uh, please speak up. Those are the ones I know of. Easy XML? Haven't used that one in a while. I can't comment. Have, have you used it much? And as another note, I would say that system engineering is not the only group building out reuse libraries that you can find on the tools network. Uh, if you went to lunch today and saw the awards that they're giving out, our friends over at Delacore got a nice award for their QMH implementation. It's quite nice. I actually do recommend you give it a look. I, I actually like it better than uh, AMC, which is our QMH version. That's why I don't include it in the presentation here. It's I like hers better. Any other questions? Comments? All right, get out of here. Go get some beer. Come on up if you got questions. Early. Thank you.